Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to welcome Sophia Sheikh here to, today to our astrobiology seminar. So uh, Sophia began her career at Berkeley, where she got an, an undergraduate degree, before moving to Penn State, where she worked with Jason Wright. Um, and now she is an MPS Ascend Fellow at the SETI Institute, working on radio astronomy, in particular, how it uh, relates to the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Um, before I do hand it over to her, I want to mention that we will be taking Sophia out to dinner tonight. Uh, so if you are interested in that, uh, please let me know. You can send me an email or Slack message um, after uh, the, uh, the the media, uh, after the media seminar. I will be heading out probably around 6 o'clock. So uh, with that, I will turn the floor over to you. Please take it away. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, perfect. <laughs> Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming out. And I'm really excited to be here and have been able to talk to a lot of you already uh, around the department. And today I'm going to be talking about um, my bread and butter research, which is in techno signatures and specifically radio techno signature work. Um, but I do want to make that connection of techno signatures back to uh, astrobiology and sort of uh, talk about them through this lens of exploring a weird and wonderful corner of astrobiology. Uh, so with that, um, my talk today is going to go over kind of a, a variety of different things moving through the process of life detection. So first motivating techno signatures as part of astrobiology, and then asking, what do we have to think about? Uh, so how do we prioritize which techno signature searches might be worth executing? And then once we've done that, there's kind of another phase of thinking about what do we look for? Uh, so I'm going to use an example here uh, where we consider exoplanets and their impact upon what a particular radio signal might look like. And then I'll go through sort of the process of how we design a techno signature or SETI survey and give a case study of what happens if we do find a signal, which is something I get asked about a lot. So, with all of that sort of uh, outlined there, I'm gonna start out with techno signatures as part of astrobiology. So I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this definition here, astrobiology as the study of the origin, evolution, distribution, and future of life in the universe. And it's an exciting field, an exciting topic, but also a difficult one. Uh, how can we study life in the universe when we are essentially confined to Earth or maybe our own solar system, if you think about our robotic extensions out into uh, other planets and bodies of the solar system? Uh, but even then, we're kind of looking for life by proxy. Uh, so in this case, life's byproducts or its biosignatures, where biosignatures have this kind of long list of uh, definitional characteristics element, molecule, substance, or feature that can be used as evidence for past or present life. And something I want to highlight is that there's a spectrum, a very complicated spectrum of life forms from terrestrial evolution that we know of here on Earth, uh, with many different kingdoms of life that I've sort of represented here. Uh, some of them are single cellular, some are multicellular, and some of these life forms show intelligent, big air quotes here, or tool using behavior, uh, so things like humans. But what I want to underscore here is that different kinds of life produce different kinds of biosignatures. So as a case study that some of you might be familiar with, I wanted to start uh, by talking about atmospheric biosignatures. Uh, so the premise here is that life exchanges energy and matter with its surroundings. There's more to the definition than that, but you can kind of start there. And that matters often in the form of gases. So if we can see direct or indirect products of metabolism in the form of atmospheric or gaseous biosignatures, then we might be able to infer the presence of life on an exoplanet via its atmosphere. And I want to highlight already that life does not have to be complex or multicellular to greatly impact its environment. We've seen this in Earth's history with the great oxygenation event to being kind of a, a keystone uh, in the history of the evolution of Earth's atmosphere. Uh, and here I'm showing a simulated Earth spectrum from Schwederman et al. 2018 that shows some of these uh, molecules that you might expect to be fingerprints showing the presence of life or other processes on the surface of a terrestrial world. Uh, so some 
proposed biosignature gases, things like methane or oxygen. Uh, those particular ones I've chosen may have a lot of abiotic confounders, but they are, at least in the case of Earth, generated by the life on the planet's surface. So exact same setup here, we can think about atmospheric technosignatures. On Earth, there are certain gases in our atmosphere, CO2, NO2, chlorofluorocarbons, and others that would not be present at present day levels on Earth, except for the presence of life, in this case, humans. Uh, so there is sort of one more philosophical jump here, because this isn't directly our metabolism, right? This is the technology that we built having an impact on the planet that we live on. Um, but you can infer the presence of a biotic source, um, because the technology had to have a builder in this case. Uh, so when I say technosignature, I'm just talking about a biosignature from somewhere else on the spectrum of life. Uh, so often, like in this case, this is the exact same methodology that we would use for these more traditional metabolized meta metabolism, there we go, biosignatures. Um, but applied to different gases. So this is a work here that did simulations from TRAPPIST-1E. If there were chlorofluorocarbons at Earth day level, present Earth day levels, or maybe uh, a couple times that, and the impact it would have upon the observable spectrum. So much like that last slide showing the impacts of these fingerprints of biosignature gases, you can also see fingerprints of technosignature gases uh, if you look back at Earth's atmosphere and potentially if we look at other exoplanet atmospheres. Uh, so if that's true, then why haven't these disciplines worked more closely together in the past? This actually came up, I think, during the graduate lunch today. Um, there are many reasons that people will give, but I would argue that most of them are historical or cultural. Um, so SETI, as it was known kind of through the 1900s, was practicable before any exoplanet-based astrobiology, where you have the first SETI search uh, was performed by Frank Drake in 1960. And then you have to wait till the 90s till you have evidence of exoplanets. And so that time lag caused some kind of weird historical precedents where astrobiology and SETI sort of evolved different jargon, different conferences, and different methodology, because early on it was very, very radio astronomy based. And admittedly, that's what I do. That's what I'll be talking about. So that radio portion of the field is still very large and influential. But I'll also put this out here, maybe a little bit of a hot take. Um, I would say that SETI and technosignatures requires interdisciplinarity in a way that maybe isn't so obvious with biosignatures, uh, because if you're looking for si signs of technology, then you have to think about why that technology was built. There had to be a reason for it to be constructed in the first place. And once you're thinking about motivation, things get a little hairy scary because now you're trying to imagine what motivations would be for a non-human life form to do something in a way that metabolism like doesn't really make you think about. And so it's very good to start involving people from anthropology, history, uh, to really be able to tell like, okay, how much of human technological development might be universal? How much can we apply? And where are we being kind of too overly reliant on the N equals one example that we have here? So it's a hard problem. I don't necessarily have solutions, but I think it can make uh, kind of more traditional astronomers a little wary because it's hard. It's a hard problem to grapple with and with, Metabolism biosignatures, you don't have to think about it as much. But I would like to underscore that we share the same philosophical goal. Um, my kind of purpose in showing the uh, atmosphere examples is to show that sometimes the methodology ex is exactly the same. Uh, one other example of this, uh, I won't talk too much about Dyson spheres in this talk, but there's the idea that if you build a lot of technology, that technology could re-radiate heat in a way that could be detectable in an infrared survey. And if you go looking for those in infrared survey data that exists, uh, you find a lot of things that are weirdly warm. And most of those are star forming regions. 
And so this links back to how are uh, stellar systems formed and what kinds of constituents do they have to be able to potentially produce terrestrial planets and maybe life. Uh, I would also argue that there should be, has been, and maybe could be more cross-pollination of techniques between the two disciplines. So we think a lot about anomaly detection in technosignature work. How do we look for life as we don't know it? Uh, we think about false positive rejection. How are we going to verify a signal and be confident in it? And things like science communication and post-detection protocols. So if we do find something that seems interesting, how do we communicate that in a way that is responsible and safe for everyone involved? And I would argue, this is something, I, again, I can talk about later in the questions if anyone's interested, but we do not currently know whether we are in a technosignature dominated universe or a biosignature dominated universe or neither. Uh, there is definitely a set of parameters where technosignatures could be more detectable, prevalent, long-lived, and or unambiguous than metabolism biosignatures. Um, that could also not be true. I'm not gonna argue that it's definitely that way, but I would argue that for now, with the amount of data that we have, it's worth pursuing both techniques. Uh, and then as we sort of narrow down the parameter space, we might kind of change that assessment. So one way that I've been thinking about technosignatures uh, for the past several years is in this framework of the nine axes of merit. Uh, which I will talk through in a second. But something you might be thinking is that it would be very easy to let your imagination run wild when it comes to thinking about technosignature searches, right? It's very science fiction. And at the end of the day, if you come up with an idea of something to look for, like, is that idea worth pursuing? Uh, and this is especially true because technosignature work is very varied in its methodology. So I've already mentioned radio signatures, uh, you can look for Dyson spheres in the infrared, you can look for lasers in the optical, you can look at light curves, you can look at atmospheres. How can you compare science that's being done across such different subfields? And so this is an attempt to qualitatively identify the things that are useful when thinking about any kind of technosignature search. So I'll quickly go through these. Didn't expect the screen to be so big, so I will be able to point at each one individually, but I'll, I'll go from the top down. So the first four axes here are kind of practical. Uh, so observing capability, like we should probably prioritize searches that can be done now uh, over those that can't really set any interesting limits yet and would require far future assets. Uh, we might want to prioritize searches that can be done cheaply, uh, maybe perhaps with archival data to those that would be costly and require or maybe several hundred in-transit hours of observing for a telescope like JWST. Uh, we might be interested in searches that have ancillary science benefits. Depends who you ask in the field, um, but searches that even if they come up with a null result for technosignatures might discover things like star forming regions, uh, unusually flaring stars or things like this, uh, could be more interesting because then you're getting this additional parameter space investigation out of your work. And then that fourth one there, detectability, is just like, what signal to noise do you expect? Will this be very easy to identify or difficult? Um, and already you might have noticed that detectability is not independent from observing capability, right? The better our capabilities get, the more detectable things will be. So I'm not saying that these are independent axes, and I do really prefer them as a qualitative, not a quantitative framework for this reason. Uh, and then we get to what I would think about as kind of the fun ones. These are things that are inherent to the technology that you're looking for. So that first orange axis there is duration. Are you looking for a signature that you expect will be short-lived or long-lived? If it's long-lived, then you might expect that it might be more prevalent throughout the galaxy or more likely that you would find it. Uh, the next one there is ambiguity. Uh, this is something that comes up a lot in I think every kind of biosignature investigation. If you do find what you're looking for, how confident are you that that signature was caused by life? 
And this is something where techno signatures really do have a unique edge, uh, I think, compared to biosignatures. Not all of them, but some techno signatures can be extremely unambiguous and have almost no astrophysical confounders at all. And then extrapolation. Uh, do we have to imagine a far future technology that we can't even figure out how we would build with present day Earth technology? Or is it something that we have already built and have had for 100 years? Uh, maybe something with less extrapolation might be more reasonable to search for. Uh, somewhat similar is inevitability. Uh, this one's a little bit weird, <laughs> um, but uh, a lot of people like this idea of waste heat from megastructures or Dyson spheres because it relies upon thermodynamics. It's like, okay, well, if you build a big metal cube, it will re-radiate heat. And that is detectable in certain kinds of surveys. Um, now that also assumes that it's inevitable that you would build a <laughs> big metal cube. Um, but if you do, then it would have this particular spectral signature. Um, versus something maybe like a radio beacon where it's like, okay, why would someone decide to point a radio transmitter at Earth and send an encyclopedia? Uh, and actually, that was a good example because uh, the last axis here is information. So you might imagine that it would be more exciting to find a signature that's information rich, where not only can you tell like, oh, there's life here, but also that life has these particular characteristics or has been there this long or has this particular chemical signature um, versus information poor, which would be like, okay, we know there's life there. If we ever get to that point, I'd be thrilled. But saying, okay, we know there's life there, but we can't characterize it at all. Uh, so the, uh, the bars, by the way, the black boxes here are an example of doing this for Dyson spheres. So for those mega structure kinds of searches. But you can slide these around um, for any kind of techno signature search across different wavelengths. And people argue about which axes might be the most important or which ones you can disregard. So it's certainly subjective. But I find that it's a good framework to think about the benefits and drawbacks of any particular search method. And also, I bring it up because then you can uh, decide to focus in on a particular axis and see where that leads you. And this is something that I did recently with a recently submitted paper that I led saying like, okay, what if you think extrapolation is the most important thing? Don't imagine any technology beyond what we've already done on earth. And in that case, what would be the most detectable? So if you do that thought experiment, you can go through all of earth's modern day techno signatures and rank their detectability distance with Earth's modern day or near future astronomical instruments. And so we did that for all of the signatures uh, that are shown in the methods on sort of the y-axis here of this figure. And then for each one said, what is the maximum distance at which you would be able to detect this techno signature? And so we've given a couple of dashed lines here to show uh, kind of guideposts for what these distances are. Um, but what I'd like to draw your attention to are those two light blue points all the way up at the top here, which are transmissions from an Arecibo-like telescope and transmissions from uh, transmitters such as those in the Deep Space Network, or DSN. And uh, these, these are uh, log scale <laughs> x-axis here. Um, so those two signatures, like these uh, radio transmissions that we can produce with transmitters we've already built on Earth can go almost, but not quite to the galactic center in some cases. And this is this is with receiving with a square kilometer array sized instrument, so a slightly near future on the receiver. Um, but it is still pretty significantly further away than our other signatures are detectable. Um, and so that's not the only reason that I focus on radio techno signatures. But I'd like to point out that one, the Earth looks totally different <laughs> now with its technosphere than it did before it had a technosphere. And it's sort of a stunning diversity of impacts that humans have had upon the Earth with our technology. But radio techno signatures are still very well motivated and they are and should continue to be a big part of our techno signature portfolio. Uh, 
So let's go through kind of what that looks like. Uh, I'm gonna talk through this plot in many stages because I think there's a lot of interesting stuff here. So I'm showing you a transmitter. You can start guessing in your head if you like what this is as I go through its features. Um, but some human transmitter that we've recorded data on. And for now, I want you to pay attention to the blue line. So in the central panel, you have a really large, narrow spike, which is called your carrier wave in radio communications terms. And the carrier wave tells the receiver what to lock into. And then far away, far enough away that I kind of clipped them closer, uh, you have your sidebands, which actually carry the information that you want to receive from the transmitter. And those sidebands, again, if you look in blue, they're wider, but still have these kind of spiky thin components in the blue uh, and are sort of symmetric on either side of your carrier. So these are ordered in frequency, uh, left to right, and also uh, signal to noise ratio or brightness is your y-axis there. Now this is integrated over five minutes. And what I can do is break that out into time and show you for each 15 second bin uh, over the five minutes, we can look at what that emission looked like. And so now we've added an additional axis of time on the Y, frequency still on the X, and the color indicates the intensity. And there are a few things I'd like to draw your attention to here. Uh, first of all, you can kind of see what causes that blue spike now, which is this red diagonal line in the center plot. Uh, but you might notice that it's not straight up and down, right? It's not a vertical line. It has this slant to it. And what that's indicating is as time is moving forward, the signal is getting lower in frequency. And you can see that motion paralleled in the sidebands as well. Now, if you don't know what that slope is and you just integrate, you just smush this dynamic spectrum or waterfall plot, uh, then you actually get the red line on the top plots. And so you'll see that like that really narrow, precise feature from the carrier gets smeared out and the signal to noise drops. Uh, and this is a characteristic that we expect for any transmitter that we would detect in a radio technosignature survey is most of Earth's technosignatures are narrow band. So that's that really thin spike in frequency space, like a laser uh, at a very particular wavelength and optical. And also we expect them to change a frequency over time. So that's called a drift rate. So real techno signatures we would expect would be narrow band and drifting. And this is an extraterrestrial techno signature. I'm not announcing the detection of aliens today at this colloquium. Uh, this is a human made techno signature. This is Voyager. So this is Voyager's downlink uh, with the carrier in the center and then the information that it's beaming back uh, in the sidebands there. So uh, you might be wondering what causes that drift or change in frequency over time. Uh, if you were within the rest frame of Voyager, you would not see this effect. Uh, this drift rate's coming from Doppler acceleration. So uh, I've modified here a figure from the ESO uh, illustrating how radial velocity searches work and sort of flipped it around a bit. So if you imagine that you have a transmitter on a planet and that planet is orbiting a star, then you're going to get some amount of blue shift as the, uh, if you're looking when the planet's coming towards you and some amount of red shift when it's radially moving away. And over time, getting from that red shifted state to the blue shifted state, you'll see this change in frequency and it should be periodic with the planetary orbit. So, this sort of effect we would expect for any transmitter that is on the surface of a planet. And in fact, uh, okay, I changed my order there, that's fine. Um, so you can calculate this and say, okay, what do we expect that slope to be for different accelerations? And what accelerations are physically reasonable given what we know about planetary systems? And this was done in the 70s, um, where there's this kind of argument about uh, how quickly Jupiter rotates. So say, uh, okay, what if you have a terrestrial planet 
with an eight hour rotation period, uh, what kind of rotational Doppler shift do you get from that? And uh, Oliver and Billingham in the Project Cyclops report found that that would lead to about one hertz per second drift if you're observing at one gigahertz. And they were like, that seems to be a good number. Like we should look for slopes that are up to that number because that's what we expect would be physically reasonable. Um, but as I mentioned, this report came out in the seventies before any exoplanets were known. And so uh, one of the first things that I kind of followed up as a paper while I was in grad school was to update this with what we know now about exoplanets. Uh, and it's not just rotation. So they only considered rotation, but there's a lot of contributions to this effect. So the Voyager slope that I showed you was not caused by Voyager's acceleration. It was caused by the Earth rotating and the receiving telescope being on the surface of the Earth. Now, the great thing about that effect is it's known. If you know where your telescope's pointing and what latitude it's at and all of this, you can calculate that back out, uh, which is what was done to kind of correct out that drift and make the nice, beautiful spike that I showed in that plot. You can do the same thing with the orbit, although that's not as big a contributor for Earth. And then you can think about, well, if my transmitter's on the surface of a planet and that planet's rotating, that's going to cause a contribution to this drift rate. And if it's in orbit around its star, that's another contribution. And finally, I tossed a term in here for other contributions. Let's say you put a transmitter onto a spaceship that's accelerating, like that could also cause an effect. I'm gonna set that one to zero. Uh, just for completion, I put that on, but not gonna think about that for the rest of this. So then we can set limits, uh, knowing what we now know about exoplanets on the sort of drift rates you might expect from a radio signal uh, that's located on say the surface of certain planets that we know or in orbit around them. Uh, so I looked at the most extreme examples of exoplanet orbits. So extremely eccentric systems like 80606b uh, or close in orbits like Kepler-78b, although of course we have many examples of those tightly packed, uh, often um, resonant systems. And rotation's a little bit harder. Um, we don't really have much data on exoplanet rotation, especially for terrestrial planets or Earth-sized planets. Um, but if you want, you can say, okay, how fast could planets of different compositions rotate before they throw themselves apart? That's an upper limit. <laughs> it might not be a good one, but it is an upper limit. And if you go through this, uh, we'll find that uh, you can set an upper limit of 200 hertz per second at one gigahertz. And that would be enough to account for all of the configurations of known exoplanets uh, from the NASA Exoplanet Archive. Uh, 200 is a lot larger than one. Um, so this was a slightly concerning result because it indicated that if we had transmitters that were on uh, tightly packed, uh, in systems with tightly packed planets, we might actually miss those signals even if we looked at the right frequency, even if we looked at the right targets at the right time because we weren't looking for signals with the correct parameters. So that, as I mentioned, is kind of concerning. Um, we then kind of dug more into this and said, okay, in the extreme cases, sure, that would be bad, but like how many planets are actually that extreme? So, uh, I worked with a student through the, uh, Breakthrough Listen RU program, Megan Lee, a few summers ago. And in her work, we kind of recognized that not only is the 200 Hertz per second drift rate limit, like much larger than the last, uh, estimate, it also becomes computationally limiting to try to implement. And so is there a way to reduce that number for practicality for searches without affecting our sensitivity too much? So Megan used the NASA Exoplanet Archive and also a de-biased version of the archive uh, to create simulations and evaluate how often these extreme cases would be hit and found some rather promising results so for all known exoplanets, you could catch 99% of uh, 
combinations of planet and orbital phase with a 53 hertz per second drift rate limit. So that's four times lower. That's good. Um, you'd only miss the most extreme 1% of cases. But already, there's a lot of biases that are worked into which planets we can detect. We can detect large planets that are close into their stars, that have inclinations that are near 90. And so if you correct those out, then you find that for a Kepler-like target star without known exoplanets, you can get away with a drift rate limit of 0.44 hertz per second at 1 gigahertz, which is actually lower than the recommendation from the 70s. So it all comes back around. Um, but this sort of work helps constrain what uh, radio techno signature researchers might look for in their data based on actual physical parameters of their target stars. So how do you implement that? How do you actually perform a narrowband radio techno signature search? Uh, step one is the longest step. <laughs> And so I'll go through this in some detail. Uh, you want to identify a promising corner of what's called the cosmic haystack. And so this is the idea that there's this combination of like looking at the right place at the right time for the right thing. Uh, and that's your haystack. And what you want to find is a signal, which is your needle. So going to this needle in a haystack metaphor. Um, this was first introduced in 1981 by this paper uh, by Wolf et al. And the last author on that paper was J.C. Tartar, or Jill Tartar, who then took this idea and ran with it. So she popularized this term, the cosmic haystack, and uh, quantified a nine-dimensional parameter space for radio technosignatures specifically. Uh, three of those are like temp uh, spatial directions, so like where is the target? Look at the right time for the right polarization, central frequency, sensitivity, and modulation. And if you get all that right, then congratulations, you found the needle. Uh, and the cool thing about this is you can quantify that. You can say, OK, we can put numbers on all of this and figure out how much of that haystack we have actually searched and processed and how much is still to go. And uh, this has been done for radio searches because it is sort of the most well-explored part of parameter space, but you could do something similar for optical, and in fact, some efforts for that are underway, uh, or other methods as well. But going back to the radio, because that's what has been worked on, in 2020, uh, Wright, Kenodi, and Lubar ran this calculation and found that about a large hot tub or small swimming pool's worth of the parameter space has been searched, of a parameter space the size of all of Earth's oceans, which might be kind of depressing after 60 years of work. Uh, however, I'd like to point out that most of that progress has been in the last couple of years. So when Jill Tarter ran this calculation in the early 2000s, she calculated that it was a drinking glass that had been searched. And I would probably guess, although this has not been rerun since 2020, that we've probably multiplied this by a factor of a few to several, just in the four years since that calculation has been done. Uh, so I think this is actually promising because the rate of search has been accelerating so much with modern instrumentation and survey techniques that we are starting to approach a point where we can set limits on particular corners of that parameter space. And that's very exciting. So I'm going to interleave this with a project that I did a few years ago. So, okay, pick a corner parameter space. Let's say the Earth transit zone. So this is the region of the sky from which an observer would see Earth transit the sun. If you want to think about it just as the ecliptic, that works too. Same, same part of the sky. And the logic here is that we find exoplanets via primarily the transit and radial velocity methods. And so if we're looking at stars, which might be able to see us transit the sun, they could know that Earth is here. They might be able to characterize that we're in the habitable zone or that we have an atmosphere with biosignatures in it. And we might be more likely to receive a signal from stars that have that information. So next step is a lot easier than quantifying an entire parameter space. 
you're probably going to have to subselect targets. Once you have a broad concept for your survey, you're going to have to be practical about what can actually be observed in one go. So here we chose 20 nearby G and K stars that were within the Earth transit zone. Uh, take your pick. Maybe M dwarfs are the most interesting. Maybe it's something else. Um, but in this particular survey, we selected sun-like stars. And then we conducted our observations. So I'm alighting a lot here. Uh, you have to select your frequencies. You have to select your things like integration time and your maximum drift rate, as I talked about at length. Um, but once you've sort of decided your corner parameter space, you take data, same as any other astronomical project. And then, as I'm sure any of you who work in biosignatures are familiar with, you're going to need a way to differentiate true signals from false positives. And in our work for radio techno signatures, the false positives are almost all human generated. Uh, local radio frequency interference, or RFI, is a huge problem for us, uh, a growing problem with things like satellite mega constellations. And it's sometimes tricky to tell whether a signal you're looking at is coming from out there in space or whether it's actually coming from very close by to your telescope. So for this project, because we were using a single dish telescope, the Green Bank Telescope in West Virginia, we used a method called on-off source observing, which I will show an animation of in a second, um, and so that we could kind of make this uh, distinction between potential true positives and RFI. And then you have an algorithm that you design to look for hits, which in this case would be linear drifting features in waterfall plots. Just picture that center panel of the Voyager plot, and that's exactly what we're searching for. So the on-off source observing, I have a cartoon telescope here um, that's observing with a beam that is centered on a target star. So the way that this ob observation was run, we took five minutes of data on that target star, and then we slewed, oh, uh, so sad, <laughs> slewed to an off source, um, which is just some nearby star, not necessarily of interest, just close by and uh, far enough away that it's a fully distinct independent beam from the original observation. And then we go back, and then we go back again. And my animations are cursed. But um, this on-off source observing, toggling between your A star and your B star, or even sometimes we'll do ABC, ABC, uh, allows you to tell whether the signal is persistent when you move away from the astrophysical source. So it acts as a control. And uh, you can do this in much more sophisticated ways if you use interferometry. So if you have an array, but it works plenty well with just a single dish. So then you're going to get a lot of hits. And this is what I tell people because they're always like, oh, what would it be like to find a signal? And I'm like, I find signals every day. <laughs> signals are normal. So in this particular survey, 20 stars, uh, about uh, 15 minutes of data each, ended up with 400,000 hits that were narrow band signals within the data set. If you then filter by the on off source observing and you say, I want only signals which show up in the on and not the off so that they seem to be sky localized, then you get down to about 3,000 events, things that the code thinks are localized. And then you look at those by eye, and maybe you see if any of them seem even potentially interesting. And for this survey, there were four signals where it was like, oh, that's kind of worth a little bit of follow-up. Uh, so events should show up in on-source but not off-source. And also, we're looking for things with non-zero drift rates. Because if you imagine you have a signal that stays the same frequency through your entire observation, it's probably sitting in the rest frame of the telescope. So there's no radial acceleration between your transmitter and your receiver, and it's likely coming from the surface of the Earth. So that ends up being a very good filter as well. And sorry for the very fast graphic here. Um, but these are the sorts of things that come through that filter. And you can see it in the most part, uh, for the most part, there's like a yellow stripe through the center. There are multiple panels from top to bottom. So these alternate on, off, on, off, on. Some of the others have an off at the bottom. And 
the yellow stripe here is pretty consistent through all the panels. Like there doesn't seem to be any alternation. Uh, so in this survey, we did not find anything that looked particularly interesting. This was one of those potentially interesting candidates that we found. So it was our best signal of interest. And there are some features about it that are nice. It's a narrow band, which means it has to be uh, generated by technology. Those very narrow laser-like lines are not emitted naturally. Uh, and it's absent in two of the off sources, which is very interesting. However, you can see there faintly, it does appear in that last off source observation and it has zero drift rate. It's basically vertical between all of the panels it shows up in. So that Im implies that it is in the rest frame of the telescope. Uh, you can dig into this a little more and you'll find similar signals that are at slightly higher or lower frequencies that are part of kind of a comb, an equally spaced comb of signals. And all of those other ones are clearly interference. And so sometimes you get these weird cases where you have aliases and harmonics and complicated internal radio components talking to, interfering with, or bouncing off each other. Uh, and you'll get signals like this, but you can usually dig around in the spectrum a bit and figure that this is much more consistent with a malfunctioning transmitter on Earth than it is a true astrophysical or interstellar, I should say, signal. So no techno signatures here, um, but if you don't find anything, you need to still publish that null result. That's so critical in techno signature work. So here we searched 20 targets from four to eight gigahertz, which is known as C-band. And we looked for signals that were about deep space network to Arecibo level strengths. So again, sort of focusing on this low extrapolation part of the parameter space. And we did not find anything. Uh, however, this was only 20 stars, and the uh, Earth transit zone is a full ring on the sky. So I'm currently working on designing an anti-solar point survey with the Allen Telescope Array, which is the telescope I work with now. And that will, over time, tile the entire ecliptic. It'll take a couple of years. And I can talk about that anti-solar point aspect later if anyone is interested, but it's just trying to take advantage of another interesting shelling point. Um, but at the end of the day, it'll tile the Earth transit zone. Uh, so you might be wondering, OK, nothing was found in this particular survey. What happens if it is? What is the procedure? So I'm going to show you a signal here uh, known as BLC1. So this was detected by the Parks Murrayang radio telescope in Australia. Um, on observations actually to monitor radio flaring in Proxen, Proxima Centauri, which is our nearest stellar neighbor. And so in these observations, you'll see 30 minute scans of Proxen interleaved with scans of a flux calibrator for, I believe, five minutes, which are the narrower stripes. And I'm going to play a video, so it's going to kind of scroll upwards here. Uh, hopefully, maybe. Yeah. So what you'll see is there's this yellow diagonal stripe that's kind of cutting through the long observations of Proxima Centauri. But that stripe is not continuing into these flux calibrator observations that sort of are in between. It's a low signal to noise signal, um, so it's a bit difficult to follow. It fades in and out. Uh, and then when we come back to Proxen a couple hours later, it's gone. It does not appear to be present anymore stays gone for a while. Uh, that red line is to kind of guide your eye uh, to, to where the drift rate is. And then it comes back in this final scan and then maybe continues into that final off source uh, calibrator observation here. And based on kind of what I've said for the uh, last couple of slides about identifying signals, you might notice a few features here that are of interest. So one is that it's a few hertz wide, so it has to be technological. It's somebody's technology. The question is whose. Uh, it has a non-zero drift rate. So already that's more promising than that signal I showed from the previous survey, uh, where it seems to have some sort of relative acceleration compared to the telescope. Uh, that drift is approximately linear, but you'll actually see that by the last panel, it's shallowed out a bit. 
And that's the kind of behavior we expect from a transmitter in an orbital environment. Because I've been saying linear and talking about diagonal lines, but in reality, you're sampling little bits of a long side curve. And so over time, you do expect that to change. And that's what we see. Uh, the signal was absent in those little off-source scans, which is expected for a signal that's sky localized. And it persisted for a couple hours. And that's kind of key because you can get drifting narrowband signals from uh, airplanes and from satellites that look kind of promising, but those things should leave the telescope beam pretty rapidly. And we did not see that here. So I spent a couple of months <laughs> working on this uh, in December of 2020, quite the time. Uh, and what I discovered, I'll keep that running for a second and then I'll address it, is A, I mean, you could kind of see that it seemed like the signal was in that final off source. And if it was, it sunk. Like that means that it's coming from somewhere nearby. But it's not really, it's a very low signal to noise detection. It's kind of hard to tell. So we wanted more proof than that. Uh, we checked the expected very centered drift that we should get from Proxen. Um, so if you look at the uh, location of Proxen on the sky and where the telescope was and the Earth's rotation and do all the drift stuff, uh, you would actually expect something with the opposite sign, about the same magnitude, funnily enough. And I checked that sign a million times, uh, but it's not consistent with a source that would, would have been on the sky in that location. Uh, and the thing that really sealed it for me was all of these things that I've been showing on the side here, which are other signals that were found in the days before and after BLC1 on different targets and in different parts of the band. So there's this comb of weird drifty things that show up uh, and there are particular relationships between the frequencies at which they appear. Uh, it's not quite as simple as a comb, like evenly spaced N, 2N, 3N, something like that. Um, but they appear to be related to clock oscillator frequencies that are common in electronic components. So it seems very certain that all of these signals are related to each other based on their morphology and spacing. And BLC1 slots right in as a tooth of that comb. Uh, and so what we realized is we're probably not seeing acceleration. That's not the cause of this shifting frequency. It's likely electronic drift. So thermal drift of a oscillator that's you know sitting by a window and the sun warms it or something like that uh, is about the right order of magnitude and can be from a fully stationary transmitter. Uh, if other parts of the system are not stable. So here, preponderance of the evidence, if I can use that phrase, indicates that BLC1 is just a pathological example of interference. It's kind of perfectly set up on the edges of a lot of these uh, like algorithmic and detectability criteria that we use. So it slipped on through. And then once we found this population of other interferers, we were pretty confident that we were looking at some sort of malfunctioning transmitter on the surface of the Earth. Um, but I don't want that to be like the end of the story for BLC1. I think it was an extremely important test case. And so what we did is we stepped back and said like, okay, what did we do with this signal? And which parts of the verification really allowed us to say like, for, for real, is this life out in the universe or are we detecting a false positive? So, uh, I won't go through this entire flowchart, but a lot of this is applicable, not just to single dish radio. You want to make sure that you're not getting false positives from your instrument. You want to make sure that if you do, if you're confident that a signal is detected, like you should be confident that you're seeing something real, that it's not from your instrument. And then you have to think about other things that could cause that, that are not from the life hypothesis. Uh, and then once you do all of that, you should ask like, okay, if it's passed enough of these tests, what do we do next? And so in the radio case, the answer would be reobserve. And for BLC1, we actually did do a week of observations on the target again with the exact same setup with the Parkes telescope one year after uh, BLC1 had been detected in case there was some annual 
recurrence of either interference or something in space, we did not detect it again. And so that sort of was the end of the story for this particular signal. But I think it serves as a very good test case of what to look for and what to do if you do uh, find something that passes your initial criteria. And I want to just throw up a lot of similar efforts that have been going on in the biosignature community for in situ technosignatures or, or biosignatures for uh, atmospheric biosignatures. So there's been a lot of thought around this, I think, and uh, not just for technosignatures, but also for exoplanet metabolism biosignatures. Uh, and I think there's a way to bring this all together into a coherent framework. So that's something I'm very interested in. So I'm going to wrap up. How'd I do? A little long. All right. Um, with a couple takeaways here. So I hope I've convinced you that there's not really a philosophically consistent way to distinguish between biosignature and technosignature work. It's all part of the same spectrum, and technosignatures are a part of astrobiology. Um, I also always emphasize this point that we have not found a technosignature because we've barely started looking in terms of parameter space. But the rate of search is increasing exponentially, and we have uh, instruments like LSST and SKA on the horizon that are going to just dump so much data into the system that if we're thoughtful about how to search that data for technosignatures, we can really make progress on the rates of occurrence of different signals throughout the galaxy and set those upper limits in a way that's much more meaningful than has been done in the past. Uh, I work on radio technosignatures, which may seem a little old fashioned, but I hope that I've sort of motivated that they are still an important part of a technosignature and biosignature search portfolio. And I also hope that I've established that technosignature research relies on many techniques that should be familiar to those of you in this room. Um, looking at the NASA Exoplanet Archive, I'm sure some of you have done, doing things like matched filtering and looking for particular signals with certain morphologies and data, false positive rejection, post-detection protocols, um, so I would love to build more collaborations that involve both biosignature and technosignature researchers and really explore those intersections more. Because I think there are all these separate papers, like these parallel papers in the literature, but not too many where we've had that active collaboration and brainstorming happening. So with that, thank you so much for listening and I will take some questions. Thank you so much, Sophia. Some lights on here. Thank you, Megan. So yes, we have time for some questions. Anything from the room to begin? You mentioned um, ESN and Arecibo class telescopes. Um, it seems like a long time ago I read something about um, missile early warning radars. That's maybe something that could make the planet Earth visible. Could you comment on that? Yeah, absolutely. So, oh yes. Um, so the question was uh, other transmitters uh, other than DSN or Arecibo thinking about maybe missile early warning radar, uh, aircraft radar is another one like at commercial airports that we think about. And those usually come in a couple orders of magnitude lower in intensity than um, these other ones that I talked about. But if you integrate over how many there are, they could be a very interesting signature. And so some of this work is being done. Um, there is a paper by Saeed et al. from a couple of years ago that looked at 4G cell towers, like integrating over all of those around the earth to see what our signature would look like. Uh, and that's actually detectable with an SKA class telescope from sort of the nearest, some of the nearest stars, depending on the observing angle. Um, so a similar thing could be done for aircraft radar, and I think those authors are looking at it, but I don't think there's been a qualitative assessment of it. Um, on your step one, that slide, uh, you talked about time. Um, is there, like, did I catch it correctly that you're looking for some sort of like if they saw our signatures receiving something back. Yeah, I was going to go back to the slide and then I got hung up on the controls there. Uh, so the question is about the 
like temporal axis of the cosmic haystack, like what does that mean or encompass, I guess? And so the way it's usually thought about is um, you could have a beacon that's out there sending a radio signal for a while and then eventually it turns off. And you could also imagine beacons that are periodic, that turn on once a year or every couple seconds or something like that. So if we do say a five minute scan, which is kind of typical in the field, then any repetition rate less than five minutes we would see, but if it's longer than that, we might miss it. And so the temporal axis is sort of the looking at the right place at the right time. And it's complicated to try to guess that or ensure that you would be looking when a transmitter is on, but at the very least you can quantify it and say, well, for these, we've ruled out these periodicities or these repetition rates based on the data that we took. So that's that's usually what's meant by that axis. Yeah. Um, so the question was about drift rates and what it means for a drift rate to be positive or negative and why it would be one direction or the other. And this, uh, for most sources that we would be observing from the surface of the Earth, we have the Earth that's rotating in a particular direction. And so depending on which direction in the sky you're looking at, everything's either moving towards or away. And, that's, and then you take the time derivative of that and you get the expected uh, slope of that motion as the Earth is rotating. So if the Earth were rotating the other direction, you'd expect that slope to be the other direction. Additional line. Mm -hmm. uh, are there any other types of radio signals besides narrowband signals that are produced only by technology and that are easily detectable or are narrowband signals the best bet for radio techno signature searches? Uh, yeah, so that that's a great question. It's actually one of the things I wish I'd had time to talk about. So fantastic. Um, I spent a lot of time going over these drifting narrowband signals because they're very common in Earth technology and they're quite easy to design algorithms for, quite easy to find. Um, but there are other morphologies that could be interesting. Um, one I always like to mention is like, we would love to be able to detect something that's turning on and off at the Fibonacci sequence or something. <laughs> um, and these narrowband drift searches might not be able to detect something like that. So we would want an additional uh, pipeline to run through to look for something like that. Maybe more likely is something like a periodic spectral signature. So something that instead of being a Hertz wide is maybe tens of kilohertz, so 10,000 times wider, that's still pretty narrow for astronomy. And if you imagine something like that, that's pulsing, pulsars pulse, but they're broadband over gigahertz of bandwidth. So something that's relatively narrow still and turning on and off periodically is technologically pretty, like, pretty unique to technology and also quite easy to find if you use things like periodicity searching uh, techniques, Fourier transform, stuff like that. So I've done a little bit of work trying to implement those uh, at the ATA as an alternate pipeline, um, but it's just sort of, an underexplored region and morphology parameter space, I think. Um, so something that needs more work, but could be just as interesting as narrowband searches. Is this more of a false experiment? Do you think it'll be possible to design a device to intentionally interfere with like the radio search by creating drift ray that is yeah, similar to what we are looking at? I think this is interesting as a way to just search for false positives and also think about the possibility of like bad faith individuals just interfering with the search. Yeah, no, we actually did think about this. Oh, yes. So is it possible that you could fake a signal by putting a transmitter maybe near a telescope that could imitate these characteristics that we look for? Um, we talked about this a little bit with BLC1. We were like, can we rule that out as something that happened? 
Um, and radio observatories are quite strict with what's allowed sort of in the general area, especially if they're in like le legally designated radio quiet zones. So something like a drone or a transmitter would probably also mess up certain RFI monitoring things at the observatory and would be pretty easy to detect. Um, but it's something that we do think about of just like, uh, we have this idea of what we're looking for. One would hope that on follow-up observations, like one of the first things we would do is go to another observatory and say, if we point at the same target, do we see the same thing? Um, so it'd have to be a pretty complicated <laughs> web of interferers. Um, but yeah, we would hope that the multi-site observations at some point would kind of cut off that, that line of inquiry. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, the nine axes of merit have an inevitability axis. And the question was like, what, what does that axis entail? And the idea behind that is that maybe uh, if you have tool using life evolve on a planet, then they kind of universally would create a particular kind of technology. And we'd want to search for that more than we'd want to search for some technology that we just happened to create on Earth or we dreamt up, but isn't very common throughout the galaxy. That's extremely hard to evaluate, right? <laughs> um, there are lots of video games with technology trees and things, but we don't know which things are necessary and which are contingent and uh, it gets kind of difficult. So that main example that I gave was that if you build structures that are large enough, you expect them, uh, especially if they're doing computation or they are a habitable platform or something like that, you would expect some amount of waste heat to come off of it. Doesn't matter what the platform's being used for, if it is built, it will inevitably generate a signature. Uh, so that's often used as an argument in favor of searching for megastructures, that they have this inevitability or like a physical law kind of grounding the signature. Uh, kind of up to you whether you buy that or not, because someone has to decide to build it, which I think is a pretty big leap on its own. But that's the idea behind it. All right, is there anything else online, Megan? All right, well, I think this is probably a good place to wrap up since we're five minutes over. So let's uh, thank Sophia again for a fascinating talk.